Sweeten your gathering with the remembrance of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Mawlana al Imam al Hussein and his honorable companions, recite the second salawat. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower on this gathering with his infinite mercy and compassion and to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, recite the third salawat to the loudest of your voices. <laughs> the world has become an extremely lonely place. Millions upon millions of people all around the world feel lonely. Even though they could be surrounded by friends, even though they could be surrounded by people, even though they could be surrounded by family members, but they still feel alone. They feel lonely. And sometimes it gets too much. To a point where people feel like giving up on life, running away from life, Loneliness is a devastating feeling and it's unescapable. And many people believe that one way to escape loneliness is to get married, to establish a family. However, recent studies indicate that in some instances, six out of 10 people who are married feel lonely. And that is not something people are willing to admit. Meaning they feel like they're trapped Even though they have a family, they have kids, they have children. But they feel like they're trapped in a marriage. And they still feel alone. And their agony and their pain is more devastating than the agony and the pain of a person who is not married. Why? Because when you're not married, it's justifiable. You feel lonely. You feel alone. When you do not have children, it's justifiable. But when you're married and you still feel lonely and alone, not many people are going to understand you, sympathize with you side with you. So, therefore, you feel more alone. You feel choked up. You can't talk about it to anybody. And the Holy Quran alludes to this. That is why, brothers and sisters, I am here to tell you that your best friend is the Holy Quran. Always go back to the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran will understand you. It will offer you solutions. A person comes to Amir al-Mu'mineen and he says, I am depressed. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says, go and read the Quran. A'jabu. He says, I am shocked at a person who has the Quran as his best friend and he is still depressed. 
Some people misunderstand this. They think that if you read the Quran, the depression goes away. No, that is not the case. If you read the Quran and you understand the solutions within the Quran and you implement them in your life, it will help you with your depression, with your loneliness, with your misery, with your problems. But if you sit every single day and you only read a juz from the Quran, two juz from the Quran without understanding, the Quran alludes to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 12, Surah Yusuf speaks of a young man, a young boy, who had so many brothers, so many siblings. His father was a powerful man. He had a huge tribe. And this young man felt so strong. Nobody can touch him. But his brothers, his own brothers, his own flesh and blood took him and they threw him in a well. Then they sold him as a slave. They sold him for a very cheap, insignificant price. And he was in the middle of the well. He was smiling. So Jibra'il comes to him. He says, Ya Yusuf, why are you smiling? It doesn't get more lonely than this. It doesn't get more devastating than this. He says, on the way when I was with my brothers and I was surrounded by them, I was thinking to myself, my brothers will protect me. No one can touch me. No one can hurt me. I have 11 brothers. But when they took me and throw me, threw me in the well, I realized that I only have Allah. I should only depend on Allah. This realization has made me smile. Allah alludes to this in the Quran. You may have a huge family, a family of 11 brothers, but yet you may, and Yusuf didn't just feel this in his mind. No, he felt it physically. From there he became a slave, then he was in prison. It doesn't get more lonely than that. And the whole time you're innocent. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3, He records the dua of Zakaria. Qala, Rabbi habli billadunka dhurriyatan tayyibah. Allah records this conversation between him and Zakaria. Zakaria says, oh Allah, don't just give me a kid. But give me a family that is full of love, full of compassion. Where I find peace. Where I enjoy them and they enjoy me. Where I live a peaceful life. Because you know, Zachariah at, at an old age, he didn't have any children. So Allah, now that you want to give me children, don't just give me a kid. Because some people, they are desperate just to have a kid. That is why Amir al muminin says, when you pray for kids, don't pray, oh Allah, I want to have a kid that's going to be tall. He's going to be built, muscles, blue eyes, blonde hair. This is what I want from you, Allah. If, I, if you give me a daughter, give me a beautiful daughter, big black eyes, beautiful. Imam Ali says, don't pray for this. Pray for something bigger. Pray for happiness, for peace, for joy, for tranquility within your family. Ta'ala, brothers and sisters, puts a lot of emphasis on the family within the Holy Quran. Allah gives us so many examples within the Holy Quran so that we can find peace and tranquility within our homes. And we have to talk about this in a time where family 
as an institution is under threat, its existence is being threatened. Family values are questioned. The establishment of family is no longer a priority. If you are not married, it's okay. You can live with each other as roommates for five, six, ten years. <laughs> and then after ten years, you may decide to propose to this woman. He's been living, her for, living with her for ten years. Now he decided, let me propose to her. As soon as he proposes, they get married. A year later, they get divorced. You may live with someone your whole life. You don't have to get married. Why is it that marriage in Islam is important? We cannot do that. We cannot live with someone if we're not married to them. Why? Because this union needs to be recognized under the eyes of God. Because I'm committing to this person. I'm committing to establishing a family. To starting a new chapter of my life with someone. And the witness is whom? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning what? I cannot escape Allah. I cannot escape the eyes of Allah. Allah is always going to be watching over me and my family and my acts. And that is why I believe brothers and sisters, we are in need To establish an understanding within the family. There needs to be some rules, some regulations. And Islam has, through the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt, through the Holy Quran, we may establish many rules that help us create better families and to have more enduring families as well. To have better relationships within our families. And I would like to share them with you. Now, I'd like to speak on a few rules. Number one, when inshallah you start a family and you have a family, the first thing that you have to keep in mind is do not belittle your spouse. Or even before you get into marriage, you're getting to know someone, you're with someone, do not belittle your partner. Do not disrespect your spouse, even if it's a joke. When does this apply? Because I don't have a lot of time and I have 13 things to share with you. I'll spend one minute on each one. If a man, for example, doesn't have the best income, he cannot provide the most luxurious home. He cannot provide the most luxurious vehicle. He's not a wealthy man. Don't shame him. Do not insult him. Do not belittle him. If anything, encourage him to go out there, to work hard, to be more productive, and facilitate for that. But belittling your spouse slowly but surely will decrease the respect between the two. And once there is no respect, even if you are Romeo and Juliet, say bye-bye to that marriage. But if he's not your Romeo, and you're not his Juliet, but there is respect, it's still possible for us to endure a relationship. Number two, let the sun not go down on your wrath. Before you go to sleep, try to resolve your problems. Speak about them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu, dkhulu fi silmi kaffa. Enter in the abode of peace. Peace means what? Tranquility. It means I go to sleep at night and I'm comfortable. Udkhulu fi silmi kaffa. How? Wala tattabu'u khutawati shaytan. Do not let this shaytan come and whisper in your ear. She made the mistake. Why would you say sorry? He made the mistake. Why would you say sorry? 
let it be, let her, you know, ignore her for three days, this, that, that's all from the shaitan. And that doesn't just, by the way, apply to your family, apply to your spouse, it applies to your children, it applies to your spouse, it applies to your parents, it applies to your friends, it applies to your relatives. Don't let an argument develop into animosity. Number three, and this is very important, please take this very seriously. For those who are married, and for those who plan to get married, before marriage, many people are attractive. You know, they want to remain attractive. But when they get married, somehow, things change. That plays a huge role in marriage. Remain attractive. Let me say it again. Remain attractive. The way you dress, your personal hygiene. Please go to the barber. Some people, I, I, I spoke about this as some people say, well, not everybody's rich enough to go to the barber. Come on. Going to the barber, your personal hygiene is as important as your food. Cut down from two of your meals, go to the barber. Look at it this way. It's very important. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says that a mu'min as a person who cares for himself, how he looks, how she looks, especially when it comes to personal hygiene. Remain attractive for your spouse. Let me say this. Rasulullah Ahlul Bayt, they teach us that to remain attractive in the eyes of your spouse. Why? So they don't look elsewhere. So you are the only person who they look at. And then when they look at you, they are attracted to you. And they smile when they look at you. And I have, some, I have seen some people, after marriage, khalas, as they say, they let it go, you know. There is no... Why? Because now I'm married. Who cares? <sighs> Number four. This is very important as well. Jealousy versus ghira. Being ghayur. Jealousy versus being protective. In Islam, brothers and sisters... The men are being taught by Allah, Rasulullah and the Qur'an that we have to be protective of our families, not controlling, not, you know, give me your phone every five minutes, let me check your emails, you cannot have a password. That's just a freak. No. Or for example, you know, you have a GPS. That's nonsense. But you have to be protective of your family, of your children. Of your spouse. I have to say this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased. I don't know about the people. Sometimes a man needs to speak to his wife about the way she dresses. If it's too revealing, if it's not appropriate, it's okay. And women enjoy a man who gives them that attention. Who's protective of them? Who cares? Let her wear whatever she wants. That's positive masculinity. A man who is protective of his family, who doesn't want the rest of the world to enjoy his wife. This is very important. And this is Islamic, brothers and sisters. Don't let the West corrupt you with this hip hop culture that, no, you know, I'm a. I'm, I'm a free person, I, I'll wear whatever I want, I'll do whatever I want. If he tells me what to wear, I'm going to... There's no such thing. A family is a union, is a unit of harmony and respect. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, I have ghira on the women of my family. And that is something important. Jealousy is not good, but having ghira to be protective of your family is extremely essential. Number five, 
I see a lot of people in the West making this mistake. They join their bank accounts. She's working, she's you know, making 50, 60, 70,000 a year. He's making 100,000 a year. They join all the... And then, that's good at the time of peace. Truce, this is good. They spend together, they go on vacations together, they buy furniture together. But God forbid, when there is a problem. My advice, keep your finances separate. Have something joint, yes, for you to, you have an agreement on, for example, how much you need to spend on the house and certain things. Do you have an agreement? That's good. The rest, keep them separate. And I want to say this. All of you know this. It is the man's responsibility to spend in the house. So if his wife chooses to separate her account and say, you know what, this is mine, it is hers. Islamically, it is her money. She's not required to spend a dime on the house. She's not required to give you a penny of her money. This is the Islamic opinion. If she gives you or she helps, this is her generosity. May Allah bless her. But if she says, no, my accounts are separate, I'm a dentist, I'm an attorney, my accounts are separate. Well, don't you want to pitch in to buy furniture? No, I don't. Khalas, it's the end of story. Don't complain. Don't say, well, no, I cannot afford this. Buy what you afford. You can't afford it? Khalas, you don't have to do it. But don't have your eyes on your money's, on your wife's money. This is not manly. Teach yourself from a young age that when I grow up, I will be the man of the house. I will spend on my children. I will spend on my wife. Maybe you'll marry a wife that's, you know, inherited millions of dollars. Or she has millions of dollars. You still have to spend at the house. You are responsible for that. That is Islamic masculinity. Number six. Listen to what they're not saying. And that is very important. With your children, with your spouse. Sometimes people act in certain ways. They're not willing to say the words. Listen to what they're not saying. The way she behaves, the way he behaves. It tells you a lot. Listen to that. You know, sometimes you see some people complaining about certain things. And it's not about that particular issue. It's about something else. Go find it. Look for it. Number eight. Never be, never be too busy for loved ones. This is very important, brothers and sisters. Spend time with your loved ones. Especially with your parents, if they've aged. Spend time with them. Don't neglect them. Don't forget them. And for fathers and mothers to spend time within the family, with their children. People are more important than things. What are things? Things, money is things. People are more important than work. Loved ones are always important. Love equals time. Make this a rule. Love equals? Don't tell me I love you, but you never want to spend time with me. Even with Allah, Allah says, you love me, spend time with me. Don't say, oh, I exi Allah exists in my heart. But you don't spend time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love equals time. Make this a rule in your life. Forgive. 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 A family without forgiveness can never survive. Believe me. If there is no forgiveness within a family, a family is bound to break. You have to forgive. And I want to speak to the young men and women here. I don't have time to get into uh, examples. Three or four rules with the young brothers and friends. Those who have parents, but they are not parents themselves. Because when you become a parent, you, your life changes. The way you think of things changes. Your perspective on life changes. But prior to becoming a parent, you don't know what your parents go through. So I want to say one. One, 
Your parents are people too. Listen to me. Your parents have given you everything. They sacrifice everything, whether it's their time, whether it's their wealth, it's their health, it's everything they have, they've given to you. You have to recognize that they are people too. If you see your parents going overboard, tell them, listen, you've given me enough. You have to do this. You have to do this. You have to go to your parents and say, listen, you need a break too. You need to enjoy life too. You need to enjoy your ho hobbies too. We appreciate you. You have done enough for us. Don't always sit there. More, more, more. This is wrong. This will ruin your relationship with your parents. If you want happy parents, so you can have a happy family, consider them people too. They deserve a break as well. And make the house a fun place. Some of, especially the teenagers, if it's not their way, if they don't get that, what they want, they go in the room, bang the door, lock the door, nobody talks to me, I'm not going to come out for food, I'm not going to speak to anyone, don't do this. You're hurting your parents. You're destroying your parents. Don't do this. Instead, come out, speak, laugh. Just like when you're with your friends and you're cracking jokes and you're laughing. and Make the house a fun place as well for your parents. Some of us, we think our parents are our servants. We go to them only when we need something. Number two, one more. You will always, listen to me, you will always need your parents. Once a parent, always a parent. You will not run away from your parents. You cannot afford running away from your parents. Believe me, don't say, well, until the day I'm 18, I'm, I'm out those doors, I'm never coming back, I don't want to speak to them. That is nonsense. I invite you to revisit those thoughts. You will always need your parents. When you're away from your parents, your mom, you will miss the way she looks at you, even if she's upset with you. The way she speaks to you, the way she wakes you up, the way she gives you breakfast, the way she washes your clothes, the way she looks after you, the way she looks at, hears your complaints. You will always need your parents. Even if, inshallah, they live long, they live 100 years and you're 70, 75 years old, you will still need your parents. You will still miss your parents. Maybe not financially, but you need to speak to them. You need to see them. You need to know that they're doing well. Don't plan your life in a way that I'm going to escape home. Instead, if you are smart, believe me, you will plan it other way around. How can I stay home as much as I can? See my parents as much as I can. Spend quality times with my parents as much as I can. You always will need your parents. Don't look at what you see on TV and, and social media of people who I, I'm, you know, I'm by myself, I'm independent. A person, let me say this very quickly, a person is taken by Hajjaj. Hajjaj was a man who would take people and he would behead them. He was a tyrant in Iraq. He took a man, he was whipping him. You have to confess on a crime. He said, I haven't committed the crime. Why should I confess? Either way, you're going to kill me. I confess, you kill me. I don't confess, you kill me. Kill me. I'm not going to confess. I didn't do this. Look at this evil man, Hajjaj. He says, go bring his son. They bring his son. As soon as they start whipping his son, he says, okay, I will confess. I will confess. They told him, why? Why did you confess? He said, because those whips were falling on my back. I can handle them. But now they're falling on my heart. I cannot handle them. You have to understand that your parents love you. They adore you. You're the most important thing in their life. What are you thinking escaping from them? Ignoring them, running away from them. You will always need your parents. 
Number three, seek advice from them. They're, your parents have 30 years more experience than you do. They have seen the ups and downs of life. Seek their blessings. Seek advice from them. Consult them. Even if you're now, you know, you are independent, you're on your own, you're making your own money, ask for their advice. I'm not saying in every single occasion you have to take their advice, but listen to it. Listen to it with your heart, not with your ears. That is why in the religion of Islam, it's important for people before they engage in marriage to consult their parents. This person, this father, this mother who took care of you, you were awake all night crying and they were both awake taking care of you. This mother that kept you in her room for nine months took care of you now at the age 25. You don't care for her opinion? To even ask her for her opinion? To speak with her? To see if she's happy or not? And lastly, always put before you panic. Before you panic, before you get upset, before you go in your room and you lock the door, put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in their shoes for a second. Say, listen, I have a puppy. Imagine you have a puppy, you have a chicken, you have anything, you have a whatever, a pet. And you've taken care of this pet for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. And you call this puppy, come. <laughs> Say, what's wrong with this puppy? He's not listening to me today. You'll get upset with a puppy, let alone your own son. Put yourself in their shoes. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe what they're doing is wrong. But they're panicking because they want the best for you. I said this yesterday, brothers and sisters. I said this yesterday. In this community, someone told me a hundred plus individuals were buried in one month, in one year. Why? Because of drugs, alcohol, gang violence. From our community. So as a parent, you're afraid. This is going to happen to my children. And they panic. So even if they make a mistake, give them the benefit of the doubt. Look at things from their perspective. You'll be un able to under understand them better. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring joy, to bring comfort, to bring tranquility to all of our families, inshaAllah. Wa sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Unfortunately, we don't have time, much time for the Aza, but I would like to take your hearts now to the city of Karbala. Let us take our hearts, our minds, our souls to Imam al Hussein all together. Let us salute him one more time and say to him, Ya Sayyidana wa Mawlana. Ya Sayyidana wa Maulana Inna tawajjahna wa istashfa'na wa tawassalna bika ila Allah وَقَدَّمْنَاكَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ حَاجَاتِنَا All of us together. يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند 